happy to tell you about Chris and Peter's great adventure because uh, let me tell you how to start it. You know, these cool projects start so randomly sometimes, but our division chief in emergency medicine, Eric Barton, met some Indian dude um, whose name was uh, Rajiv um, um, Singhal, who now I know who this Indian dude is, at a EM meeting in Singapore. And he came up to him, and this was a couple, four years ago now, five years ago, came up and said, hey, we're looking to do training for EMTs. Can you guys at the University of where, Utah, can you help us? And Eric said, I think so, let me get back to you. So months and months went by, and the guy finally called back to Eric and said, well, can you? And he came to me and said, can we train EMTs in New Delhi? And I'm like, absolutely. Why, of course you can. I had no clue how to do it, nor had I ever done such a thing, but who could say no to such an invitation? So the first thing I did as an executive is I hired somebody who actually knew how to do that job, and that was Chris Stratford, who is an experienced uh, multi, many, many decades of experience as an EMS instructor. He's taught, he teaches for the state of Utah EMS program for Salt Lake City Fire, uh, is one of the best known EMS instructors in the state for paramedics and EMTs. So I talked to Chris and said, hey dude, do you want to go to India? And he's like, that sounds like it would be an adventure. And so and there we begin. So that was three years and I don't know, eight or nine trips ago. I've lost count at this point. And we are now virtual New Delhiites ourselves. And we'll tell you about our adventure. So Chris, you want to open up? Yeah, absolutely. This is, I'm excited to be here. This is a lot of fun. You guys have... Um, Good background in global health, right? Uh, it's not a city of good students, but you know, students not good students. So uh, you have good background in global health, yes? Yeah. That's where your that's where your your uh, classes are. From my understanding, is in kind of researching some of you, as some of you are, are undergraduates and studying and learning about that, and and certain faculty and staff and all that being here. So. What we decided to do is to talk a little bit about um, this kind of transition about our experience about what's being there. We wanted to start with healthcare in India. And this was a, an interesting one for us to kind of figure out because you may know more about than some of us because we've been focusing on that EMS side but the emergent side of it. One of the things that we came to kind of realize is that uh, there's not a lot of money in India. And different states are funded in different ways between how the state funding goes and how national funding goes for its uh, health care and public health initiatives that are there. And this is, this is true for all of the myriad aspects of public health that are occurring in India. And it's no different in EMS than, than where it was for us and kind of what, what we were experiencing. What we found out, though, is as we did this research in this background is that the people are really no different than any other man in here. They have young people and they have childbirth problems and they have older people that have heart attacks. They have a, a very um, strong up and coming young population with lots of wild and new crazy ideas when I think about grad news kids and kind of where they're at and, and what they're doing and how progressive they are and how, how, how small the world is becoming because of the cell phones in the air connecting all of them together. Um, they're really, as we kind of explore that in the populations, they're really no different than, and the problems that they experience from the DMS side are really no different than, than what we experienced here in the U.S., which was us. So who, who's been to India? Anybody? Yeah. You've been there, right? Okay. I suspected so, yeah. <laughs> um, so feel free to, to Pipe up. And first of all, when I lecture, I prefer to be interrupted as often as possible with questions. So please uh, interrupt, raise your hand if you have questions, or if you have any um, you know, perspectives, please let us know. Again, our, our you know, extensive experience is a, is a very thin slice of India because we go to Delhi, um, and we always go to Delhi, and we've been teaching EMS. But India in general, for those who aren't so up to speed, is in the midst of a giant revolution of of prosperity in so many ways. It is a poor country. It's a very third world country with some of the wealthiest, 
most uh, obscenely uh, extravagant hotels and landmarks that you'll find anywhere. There's so much money there in pockets that it's hard to believe, but there's the vast, vast poverty underlying all of that at the same time. The consequence of this is there's a middle class growing in India that wants Western medical care, that wants good quality medical care um, like they see the rest of the world having. So there's a great interest. That's why they're interested in training EMS, essentially, in training uh, better ambulance services, because they don't really have any right now, frankly. So. Uh, the, some of the problems that we started to explore about what EMS would be interfacing with and effects of issues that they would be dealing with and all that really weren't a lot different than anything else around here. They have water issues. We have water quality issues. They have pollution and they have overcrowded areas and we have the same kinds of things uh, from, where, from where we're at. This was an interesting picture here because this illustrated uh, the different modes of transportation that we found in India as we started to explore. You know, as you guys can see that a little bit. Um, all the different things that they had available to them for transportation as EMS providers, we had to look at this very carefully because roadside accidents and from pedestrians and motorcycles and all that, the, the risk there is just tremendous. And this was a common thing that we saw here. I want to draw your attention right here. There's a motorcycle that has five people on it. There is a whole family. A, the father driving, there's a young child sitting in front of him. Mom is sitting on the back. There's a child between the two of those, and mom is holding another child. And this is this is a common thing that we used to see quite frequently as, as we drove around Delhi. And so we started to look and identify some of these big things uh, that uh, we would see as potential problems that the EMS folks that we're training would have to deal with. And then um, diabetes was one of the big things. Because the middle class is growing and they're eating more and more of a Western diet and they're getting fatter and developing amazing uh, diabetes issues, actually. So we decided that as we explore kind of health care issues within India that we were really dealing with the same kinds of things. And so that made it kind of easier for us. It made us feel a little bit more comfortable about what we're teaching as far as these populations go. So let's take just a few minutes here. We'll talk a little bit about kind of uh, EMS in general within India and what we found as we did the assessment there, uh, this needs assessment of finding out what kind of healthcare problems they have. As I had mentioned a little bit earlier, the, the, the states that have figured out how to make money in India, whether it was a, on a tourist population or whether it was, was uh, computer technology or other resources that are available there, on the state level, if they knew how to make money, they could afford more of those resources. They didn't have a lot of extra support from the federal government as far as education goes for children and for health care and for EMS. So we saw very different, as we kind of explored, very different uh, types of EMS systems that were set up in different states around India. And Delhi itself had some EMS populations. They had CATS was the first one that they had, mm -hmm. is that right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, CATS is the uh, Centralized Ambulance Transport Service. Um, and they have these little bitty ambulances um, with folks that have very rudimentary training. They're basically drivers. They really have drivers that will pick you up and drive you to the hospital. But not a 911 system with, with uh, care and route um, like we expect here, trained professionals en route. Uh, and that's Delhi. And they only have about 35 of these little ambulances in a city of 18 million people. Um, they, and no one knows the phone number to call them. It's basically not you. But hospitals have their private ambulances. Which is so this is, this is in uh, Gujarat. This is one of the ambulances. They have this little four-wheeler off to the side there. But as we started exploring this a little bit more, what we found is very modern-day ambulances. We found Mercedes ambulances that were very sophisticated, had state-of-the-art equipment in it, and had very well-trained people that were beyond this basic first aid, this, or this medical taxi kind of where they were at. But the thing we didn't find anywhere is to find anybody with a paramedic level education comparable to what we have in the expectations of paramedics from the U.S. We didn't have that level anywhere we could find in India. They had might be equivalent to an advanced DMT. Yeah, which they call a paramedic, but it's not the same as our paramedic. 
So that term paramedic was used for a lot of different roles and different capacities, but didn't have that same degree of education or that same level of expectation that we would see here. Any guesses on what um, helped to create that perspective of paramedics and, and to develop that, that understanding of EMS within the U.S.? Back in the 70s, early 80s, when, when mm -hmm. EMS was really growing, what was it? TV show emergency. It was the TV show emergency. Oh. Yeah, with Johnny and Roy popping by cars and talking on the radio to the hospital and transmitting EKGs and all that. We had the media here in the U.S. to help do that advertising and set that expectation of what paramedicine was like and what EMS services were. And that did more for the growing EMS system up in the U.S. And in India, they haven't quite hit that yet. They don't have any any real TV shows or anything there that have that same sort of draw and appeal to educate the public and help them to be more aware of what EMS services were. You, the, the telephone numbers that were there were really, it was just whoever you, the local ambulance service was. If you knew their telephone number, then you could call them and you could have them come pick you up. And again, we saw this, this um, image there that says this is for really poor system and it's not very sophisticated in a lot of areas it really was. But then we also saw in pockets of areas within India where they had good systems. Still not a centralized 911 system. Uh, they, you could call that one number and have it routed through uh, an emergency dispatcher and go to the right agency or location of where you're at to have them respond. But, uh, There's a couple of states in India that do have um, um, the uh, Karnataka, for example. Uh, Bangalore? Yeah. It's a 108 number. Yeah, 108 number. And actually they have a, I just toured it on our very last trip, a very impressive um, EMS system, which is well established uh, within that state. India is very state-centric, very provincial as far as states go. And what one state has and another may not. They have less of sort of the federal overlay, uh, I'd have to say, than we do, although they certainly have some of that. But Delhi, uh, the largest city in the, uh, in the uh, country, doesn't really have, in effect, any kind of significant EMS system. Um, so well, the focus on 108 is more prevention of recommend and child health. Care. That's right. He said the focus of the 108 program, which is in the state of Karnataka, and actually several other states also now, it's really spreading. Uh, it's a really impressive program, but they really have a focus on um, rural delivery of, of babies and prenatal care uh, and that sort of thing. A very heavy emphasis because that's a very important uh, issue, a very big need there. And they also do, interesting, a whole lot of poisonings, um, um, organophosphate poisonings because of the farming accidents is a real common thing that they do. But their EMTs are trained to deliver babies, even though they're basically EMT basics, but they're trained to deliver babies and they do a fair amount of it actually on the ambulance. But that's not in Delhi. Yeah? Could you give a sense of how much it costs? Program, a woman who goes to the hospital for the gets a stipend, a small stipend, and I don't know how that applies to her 108 areas, the 108 is free, and it's, a, it's, it's basically taxed, you know, it's a tax-based uh, subsidized program, uh, and it's free. Um, with private ambulances, the patients will get a bill. Uh, if you take a private ambulance to your private hospital, you'll get a bill. The government services are free, basically. Um, as far as I know, I haven't worked in a government hospital, but I think they're free. Uh, the private hospitals, which are booming in, in India uh, now, uh, are uh, very, well, they're very expensive for Indians, uh, but the insurance, the concept of health insurance is just catching on. And if I could invest in anything, you can't invest in India, interesting, you can't buy stock, that's right. Um, but if I could invest in health insurance companies, I would do it because there's about that much of the population of 1.2 billion that have health insurance now, and it's going to be a whole lot bigger really soon. Uh, people want health insurance because they want private medical care. Uh, I think that's a safe statement. So the, the nationalized health insurance covers a certain amount of what they're doing, but then this, with this growing middle class population, which is even more of that, which is where the insurance is going to be. You can afford better care, but just pay out of pocket to a uh, private hospital in order to afford better services than what you can find there. 
Now, a hip replacement that would cost $75,000 here will cost $7,500 in India. And so there's this giant medical tourism business for people, not so much from the states in Europe, although that's growing, going to India and other, other rather sophisticated medical countries, but a whole bunch of folks from Africa and the Middle East where they really don't have much of a medical infrastructure coming to India to have procedures done um, and paying, uh, you know, relatively little money compared to our costs uh, to get that work done. And the hospital we work for, just to give you an idea of the quality, we'll show you some pictures here in a second, is a cardiac center that does about 10 times the cardiac surgeries and uh, cats that we do here at the University of Utah. It's a private hospital. And it's Joint Commission certified. For those of you who don't know, Joint Commission is the same certifying agency that certifies, or at least used to anyway, certified the University of Utah uh, and other hospitals in the U.S. So there's an international branch of Joint Commission, and their hospitals are all Joint Commission certified. They're gorgeous inside. They look like hotels. All right, let's talk a little bit more about um, the EMT development and kind of how Peter mentioned how that had came about with um, the starting of that. But it really boils down to the Commonwealth Games in 2010. Uh, as they were looking for uh, the, the company that we're working with, Fortis Healthcare, was awarded the contract to provide EMS services for the Commonwealth Games. The Commonwealth Games are athletic Olympic type events similar to what um, we have here in 2012. But these are uh, very popular, only open to British Commonwealth countries who could come and they participate in this. And so Florida has got that contract for it. And they bought ambulances. They decided to be the EMTs in order to staff these ambulances and organize that. So uh, that's really where this all came about, where we started, was in response to this, this request for uh, EMTs and some of things. So we wrote a curriculum. The curriculum came together. It was based off of U.S. standards, based off of the current EMT curriculum in the U.S. There's 2010 curriculum uh, instructor guidelines that were established by Department of Transportation, National Highway Traffic Safety Administration. We use those as guidelines. We brought our contact from the area, the physician that was in charge, we, we planned it out to see what was appropriate for them and what wasn't. One of the things we found out is the EMS curriculum we use here is it's pretty common for us to teach EMTs how to assist a patient with the own medicines that they've been prescribed, such as an ureterose inhaler or uh, an epinephrine auto-injector for an acute reaction or a nitroglycerin or an aspirin, something like this. The patients prescribe those. They may not be comfortable with using them. So the EMS folks will then approach them and, and help them do that. What we found is that's not a very common thing in India to be prescribed a meter dose inhaler to take home. Uh, the same with nitroglycerin or with an epipen auto-injector. These, these uh, assisted medications that are common in the EMS curriculum are just not common things that we found within that Indian population. So we excluded those from the curriculum. We took those out and tailored it and covered this for them. Uh, typical EMT curriculum here in the U.S. is about 120 hours. So we took out some, some legal lectures. We took out some hazardous materials and mass casualty operations. We covered those in, in a more simplified format. And some medical problems that they don't see very common there. And built that curriculum around that. And we went over and taught the first course in, uh, in Delhi with, remember where there was there? 10 students, 12 students, I think, in that class. I think it was that first class that we started. Um, and we got the beginning of it off to a good start. We spent two weeks there getting them a good solid foundation beginning of the curriculum. And then had uh, Dr. Shrivastava, our contact there, the physician there. He was the one who then went on and talked for the next two, three weeks. So the, the 120 hour curriculum we had was just a little bit smaller for the Indian population. And he taught that in a four week period of time. And that was our first class got off to start. We took a team over there and we uh, tested them and decided whether they understood the concepts and where we were at and whether they could master those and whether they had the skills in order to do it. And they all performed very well. Uh, they grabbed those um, concepts and those things 
a little bit easier. And we'll talk a little bit at the end about what some of the experiences and the lessons that we learned as far as uh, teaching EMS in this population and, and kind of reviewing that. We did this um, after we had taught the initial course, tested them, made sure that they were okay with it. Then uh, we left, uh, we had two classes going a day, one in the morning, one in the evening. Five hours in the morning, five hours in the afternoon, evening. They needed to train close to 200 EMTs, and they really didn't have very much time. They, they were a little delayed in getting the project started, which we've come to learn is a very common thing uh, in India. Um, but we, uh, after the first class, Dr. Shavastava picked out, uh, I don't know, what was it, the four or five probably top uh, students, and then Chris and I came primarily, and a couple other folks actually at that point, and did a, a brief instructor course to teach them the basics of teaching, and they became assistants in the class and, and would then help sort of pass that along. And it became a pretty self-sustaining process. Uh, until the overall ended up training, I think it was about 178, 180, running two classes a day, which was pretty busy for him. He, uh, uh, Dr. Spostro got this all set. He had a great program. It was set, caught the attention of his superiors, and once this was done, Colin Walls came and went, and they got thinking about that and said, hmm, maybe we should raise the level of care that we're providing within our own ambulance service and teach to teach paramedics. And, yeah. and kind, of, phase of work kind of there. said, hey, we heard you guys talking about that paramedic thing, because we explained to him how EMS worked in the U.S. and the different levels of EMT that exist. And so they said, could we have paramedics? Could you train paramedics? And of course, Chris and I said, sure, we can do that. And they're actually paying us for this. I mean, they pay for our, our um, time and they pay for our transportation um, and uh, give us room and board while we're over there. So, go for us. Most of the, the Fortis has three ambulance operations, one located in Delhi, one in Mumbai, and one in Bangalore, and they're, they're pretty robust systems in where they're at. One of the things that we found is that they have fewer multi specialty hospitals is the term that they use in India. It seems like uh, there's a cardiac specialty hospital or a renal specialty hospital or a women's and children's specialty hospital. And what they would do is someone would show up at a renal hospital and they would be having a heart attack. They would do some initial stabilization there, then they would put them in an ambulance. They would transport them to the cardiac hospital in order to get the proper workup and treatment for their cardiac condition that they have. So they were moving patients around from hospital to hospital, and we needed an ambulance service to do that, or to move them from a private hospital or from a uh, government hospital to a private hospital that had better resources for them. And so, most of Fortis's ambulance service was doing inter facility transfers. Uh, in EMS, we talk about the difference between an inter facility transfer versus a, uh, a scene call of arriving to a roadside accident or someone who collapses on the street. We found those to be less common, less frequent, and that was simply because uh, the population didn't have a good understanding of EMS services, how to access them, what they could do, what they couldn't do. Uh, some of the more educated people understood where those ambulances were and how to get to them, but a lot of the general population didn't have a clear understanding of, uh, of the type of EMS services that were available to them. So the idea was in training paramedics is to take the physician and the nurse out of the ambulance who are currently moving patients in air facility transfers and replace them with paramedics who have the same level of skill and ability uh, or a good level of skill and ability to manage that patient through these routine transfers of where they were at. They could be stabilized at one hospital and then paramedics would care for them in route uh, coming from, from one to the other, from one hospital to the other. So we had more complex assessment skills. They, we added IV skills to it. We added uh, airway management uh, was another big um, key that we added to that, uh, in addition to the basic skills that they had already had. Uh, this is the batch that we're currently working with right now. We've, um, so let me just a sec. So the EMT class is a four-week class. A paramedic class in the U.S. is typically a year. 
Um, it's a it's 1,200 hour curriculum, uh, including clinical time and classroom time. Um, clinical time being ride-alongs and uh, shadowing in emergency rooms and that sort of thing. Um, so this class that we uh, first put together, the first paramedic class, we used again the American paramedic curriculum, modified it as Chris mentioned um, uh, to the needs of the folks in in Delhi and, and made it kind of appropriate to what they wanted them to do and a whole bunch of it is emphasizing cardiac because the cardiac hospital is their main sort of central hospital. Um, it ended up taking longer than a year. Uh, it was supposed to be a one-year course, but because of some delays and some, some remediation that needed to be done, it ended up taking longer than a year uh, to do it. So here's some pictures of our, of our first paramedic class uh, right here, who will be graduating in May, actually. Good question. They were all nursings, uh, nurses already, graduate nurses. About half of them had some clinical experience in a hospital already, and the other half were relatively fresh graduates within a year of graduation with very little experience at this point. Um, so interestingly, in India, different than here, if, you know, sort of in the pecking order, the hierarchy of medical care providers, a uh, paramedic is actually higher than a nurse. And this was the case I noted in uh, Karnataka as well. Uh, all of the paramedics there were nurse graduates already also, and then the paramedicine is an additional skill above that, essentially. However, that being said, a nurse curriculum, my sense is the nurse curriculum in India is not as in-depth or um, skilled in many ways as a nurse curriculum would be here. Is that, would you say that's true? Yeah, okay. I got the sense that a, nur a fresh nurse graduate has kind of like an EMT level skills uh, here in the states, essentially. Okay, okay. Are most nurses men? Uh, no, most are women, but but the man nurse population appears to be growing in India, actually. But by far, most are women right now. Yeah. That was an interesting question when I first started looking actually at the EMTs, is who the population was that we would recruit in order to be. EMTs. And the answer that we got <coughs> from Dr. Shavasta was, is we're going to elevate our nurses to the level of an EMT. And that kind of had us raise our eyebrows mm -hmm. for the same thing that, that Peter had talked about, is that some nurses in India tend to be more task-oriented and complete what the physicians ask them to do. They're not given a lot of independent thinking or critical thinking. And so we, we decided that we were going to train them to be independently. Yeah, and that was the biggest of everything we were teaching. That was the biggest paradigm shift, is that as a paramedic, when you arrive at the scene of an ill patient and you don't have a physician or a nurse with well, a physician with you, because, again, the nurses really don't have these skills, you have to be able to make an assessment and intervene immediately. You don't have time to bring them to the hospital. So this was a really new paradigm for them to be independent um, sort of providers uh, and to take a set of uh, standing orders and protocols and to operate from those and then call the physician and tell them what they did as opposed to calling to say, what do I do? Whole different paradigm shift. That was really interesting for us through the whole class. Let me emphasize at this point that I think the best goal in global health is to create a self-sustaining improvement in the country, in the location where you're working. Uh, to teach them to fish, don't just fish for them, essentially. Um, this program we put together has in it a, a self-sufficiency um, program. When we finish in May and graduate this class of the first paramedics, four of them or so will be We'll go through a train the trainer program and we'll become teachers for the next class. Um, and then we will come out instead of four visits or so for this class, we may only come out twice to do skills assessment and that sort of thing because they can pick it up on their own. And we really may only come out one time for the third class after this. But for the time being, Fortis wants to continue training paramedics. They're really thrilled with this. Um, they like the quality of care. They like the fact that the physicians don't have to be on every ambulance run. Uh, and they really, really, really want to advertise this heavily. 
in the community to let people know they have this, you know, world-class certified paramedic system. Uh, that is, it's really important to folks there to have a Western stamp of approval on medical things. Uh, so they're going to make the most of this, and they already have had multiple press releases about this. Yes, sir. In Delhi, no, there's none. Um, in Delhi, no. This is a project of a private hospital. What we have done, I've participated in an EMS, a uh, large EMS symposium in Delhi that was sponsored by the large government hospital there, uh, who's trying to encourage EMS in Delhi and in the country also, along with emergency medicine as a, as a specialty. Uh, so little by little, I think there will be some oversight. In Karnataka, However, there is a great deal of government oversight. Uh, the whole program is really run and overseen by the government in what's called a private, a public-private partnership. The, the ambulance service, the 108, is a private company, it's a private nonprofit, that is funded by the government and overseen by the government, has to meet certain benchmarks uh, and that sort of thing. So it's a really nice partnership. The government in India, frankly, and no offense intended, in my experience, could never pull off development of an ambulance service in any one person's lifetime. Uh, and, and it's, am I wrong? It, it, it just, the bureaucracy in India is extraordinary. The economy is growing in spite of the government. Be, because of private enterprise, here, here. Yeah. So what the, a few smart people in the Karnataka government de decided was we have some money and we can buy expertise to put our program together and that's what they did uh, and pretty much let the private company run it uh, while they supervise it and fund it. Uh, Delhi doesn't have that right now. Uh, I hope that in 10 years they will, maybe sooner actually. The training curriculum? The EMT curriculum? Uh, yeah, it's, I did. I actually looked at it. Um, it's a, it's, as Chris said, kind of an, what we would call an advanced EMT or EMT intermediate curriculum. It, it's heavily uh, focused on the basics of the EMT sort of basic curriculum, um, you know, airway management, you know, not intubation. A couple of which are, um, are childbirth related, actually, that they utilize uh, and, are, and are trained to utilize. And there's a real heavy emphasis on maternal fetal care uh, and delivering babies. Uh, in Karnataka, the ambulance service, well, they transport thousands and thousands, but of the thousands of pregnant moms they transport, about a third of them deliver in the ambulance on the way because they're coming from rural villages and it might be an hour, an hour and a half transport. And they'll deliver a third of the time. So the NTs are delivering babies right and left. It's kind of cool, actually. Um, so it's a modified curriculum based on what they need, but it compared to our EMT basic slash uh, advanced EMT curriculum. If you use the medications to compare them, the EMT basic here has three medications that make up most steroids, advanced EMT has about 10 or 11. A paramedic here has 26 to 30 different medications that they stop pretty with them that they can administer as opposed to the eight that they have there. So we're about out of time. I just want to emphasize, um, Chris and I have just had so much fun and really feel like, you know, it's the little pebble in the pond that it makes a ripple, but we're actually making a little bit of a difference and setting a standard. Even though it's with a private company, which is less satisfying than if this were the government hospital and we were doing this kind of for public health, but when you set a standard at the private hospitals, the government hospitals, all of whom have some very smart docs and some good folks, just they're resource limited and they're bureaucratically limited. But they see that and that's, that becomes the goal that they strive for. So we feel has asked us to help them develop an emergency medicine residency program, uh, which is really exciting for their physicians. So this would be MBBS graduates, uh, graduate level or, or brand new physicians that will specialize in emergency medicine, which is recognized in India, um, I think it was about five years ago, I think it was 2009 or so, as a specialty. In, in by the Indian um, Board of Medicine. Um, and so we will, they want to start, I, they, 
Well, never mind. It's not it. They would like to start this year. They wanted to start last year, but it's been a little delayed. And they think they're going to start this year. We're ready. We have a curriculum ready for them. We're ready to go there and begin teaching, uh, which will provide some really cool opportunities for faculty and residents from here to go over there and help teach uh, and supervise. And then for their, their new residents to come here, and we've built into the curriculum two-month rotations over here uh, to see how we do emergency medicine. Um, so it's, it's really exciting, and it looks like this project is going to continue. This is uh, uh, Fortis Escorts Cardiac Institute, uh, which is the, our main hospital. It's their mothership hospital and their main teaching facility for this private uh, company, uh, Fortis. Uh, and they have, uh, again, they do on the order of 10 times the cardiac procedures there that we do here at the University of Utah. Uh, the volume is amazing. Uh, and the, yeah, I think it's big. The good, the good is too big and the bad is too big. The good is too big and the bad is too big. What do you mean? Yeah, whatever you see, the good thing also it happens in large quantities, bad things also happen in large quantities. So it's difficult to compare it for somebody who wants India is a land of contrast. There, it is so complicated and contrasting rich, poor, clean, dirty, you know. Um, the one thing that I don't see contrast in is I have, I don't know, it's my wife Ruth in the back who goes with us on every trip. Um, have we ever met a mean or nasty Indian person? I mean, they are so welcoming and warm and friendly and have made, made us part of their families and we go to weddings now and I mean, it's like really cool. Uh, yeah, it's really nice. Wonderful people. Wonderful. Yes, sir. I can't resist sharing Professor. A, a predecessor of this in a different setting. Saudi Arabia did the same thing but for different reasons. And let me explain why. I, when I was administrator of hmm. this, we funded an EMT training program in Saudi Arabia because this wealthy little nation had highways going between Riyadh and Jeddah and all this sort of thing. They have, I don't know the size of the royal family, but there are thousands of young princes with more money than brains. And they had Porsches and Maseratis and Ferraris and this and that. And they would crash on the freeway and die because for lack of getting to the nice little hospitals. And believe me, they had fabulous hospitals, especially in Riyadh. Wow. I mean, really state-of-the-art, U.S. manned and trained. So anyhow, we trained, we funded a training program for EMTs to get these rich young men, only men driving, of course, uh, from their crashed vehicles <laughs> to the hospital so they could survive. It was not just altruism, it's part of our State Department's efforts to do good things for mm -hmm. our friends, and this was considered a thing we could do to help Saudi Arabia get modern. But that program, just like you said, took root, and they, their biggest problem was cultural because it wasn't cool enough for real Saudis to do. You have oh, to understand the class system. interesting. Yeah. It was so extraordinary there. All of the scut work is done by imported labor. And the, the, the large extended royal family live in luxury and don't only do professions. But believe it or not, they we managed to convince them this was cool enough for a Saudi to do. So wow. you could be a real Saudi and be an EMT. But I'm not sure we call it, I, I must admit, I don't remember if we called it a paramedic or mm -hmm. what have you. But anyhow, it's the same model, and it was in a developing country, but was way far developed in India as far as hospitals yeah. and highways but not very developed socially or culturally or educationally. Well, our paramedic students, you mentioned, is it cool enough? that They actually walk around with a little swagger around the hospital. They have their special white shirts that nobody else has, and they're recognizable, and everyone knows they're special. But they are concerned, can they get a job? Because they, in Delhi, are the only paramedics that really exist at that level. So they're really wondering, can I find a job? They all have a contract with Fortis for two years. Uh, after training, but after that period, where will I go? It's very interesting. I, mean, I come from a small town. I think the paying capacity of that town is much more than the facilities available. People have a lot of money that mm -hmm. they can afford. They can afford the care. Probably four days is too expensive, but maybe half of that. Sure. But there is no service available, so there is that gap. Wow. People can afford, but there is no service. Yeah. So for every small thing, you have to go to the capital of the state, like Bangalore and Karnataka. Wow, for every small thing. Yes. People can afford sneaking. Well, are we done? We are. Unless you have any other questions.